Well, some of you Oregon fans aren't wild about staying in the Pac-12. Oregon might be stuck there. What about the independent route? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All suited up on a Thursday. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day if you're watching on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Like, comment, subscribe, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show. Post Southern Utah Broadcast, you guys have spoken many a times that you like the suited look, so... We keep the suited look for the show today, and we keep the mailbag questions coming because you guys are chocking that thing full of questions, and man, I absolutely love it. This one from John, an interesting one. Hey, Spencer, here's a question for the mailbag. To be up front, I'm a fan of Oregon staying in the pack, but what are the pros and cons of Oregon going independent like Notre Dame? Hmm. I know FSU and Clemson can't really afford to leave the ACC with the grant of rights penalty, but could they go independent and make it economical? It seems like a third super conference isn't really viable and couldn't compete with the viewership of the SEC or the Big Ten, but could Notre Dame, Oregon, Clemson, and FSU make it work as independents, maybe with collective bargaining? Well, collective bargaining, if they were all independents, that would basically be a conference at that point in time. Now, let's start with the first part of the question. Independent, pros and cons. Pros. You wouldn't be tied to the Pac-12 if you felt like that was a place that didn't have a strong long-term outlook. You'd be able to control your schedule every year. Oregon would probably be able to attract some pretty high-profile games much like Notre Dame does. Number four, it would be fun, interesting, and exciting. (laughs) Now, the cons. I don't think Oregon has a big enough brand to be an independent like Notre Dame. Now, in 2022, their TV viewership was behind Notre Dame. It wasn't that far behind. But here's the thing. I get where your head is is at here, John. Totally do. I don't see this as a realistic option for the Ducks. Interesting thing to speculate about. Absolutely. Hence why I'm bringing it up on the show. But Notre Dame having its own deal with NBC is very unique. Now, is Oregon closer to Notre Dame brand-wise than the other FBS independents like BYU up until very recently? Yes, they are. However... Is there a guarantee that Oregon would be able to find a media rights partner like that? No. That is less assured than the Pac-12 giving a solid media deal at this point in time. Like That is venturing into a depth of the ocean that I don't think I'd be particularly comfortable with. Now, if Oregon felt good about it, then... Okay, perhaps, but as much as many of you do not want to be in the Pac-12 going forward, which I understand, but I just want to see the league be the best it possibly can, it is Oregon's best option at this point in time in terms of options they could actually pursue realistically. Now, his point about FSU and Clemson wanting to leave, well, could they make the economics work and go independent? I don't think so, no. FSU and Clemson could make the economics work in terms of what they would have to pay in order to get out of the grant of rights in the ACC, only if they were going to go to where there's a lot more money in the SEC or Big Ten or, you know, wherever they would go. But that is a that is an expensive endeavor, number one. And number two, it is not clear at this point in time, though it may not be impossible, that it is a fully legal and available option to those schools. So. The idea of going independent, I think, sounds a lot better than reality because where are you going to go if you're Oregon, right? Notre Dame is so unique. The history of that, there's this great college football documentary, and I mean 
amazing. You can find it on ESPN. It's for some reason hard to find in the app when you search for it. It's called The American Game. And it was celebrating 150 years of college football. And they talked, you know, it was a great documentary. There were, I don't know, eight to 10 episodes or so. And they talked about everything. Media, polls, Heisman, all this stuff. And Notre Dame had its own episode in there. And yes, Oregon was featured several times, uh, you know, getting mentioned here and there, particularly when they talked about the uniforms and facilities arms race that I don't know if it's fair to say Oregon jump started, but they were certainly a focal point, you know, back uh, just prior to 2010. Like they were very forward thinking on that front and have uh, reaped the benefits in, in the years that followed. So it's a great, I mean, it is so worth your while. I promise as a college football fan, I binged that thing in two and a half days. I mean, it didn't take me any time. I could not stop watching it. It was so thoroughly good. But anyway, I I bring that up to say that Notre Dame is so distinctly unique that I don't think they're comparable for literally anybody else because the, that that contract, that agreement with NBC to put their games on there and their games alone is just not something we've seen before. Now, NBC is, I think, a part, at least on Peacock, with the Big Ten deal. And maybe the SEC, I don't remember. It all gets... I know they're involved with the Big Ten because they're going to have a, a a big game every, every Saturday on Peacock. But I don't think the the economics could work out because the uncertainty there of finding a media partner on your own, that would be immensely challenging. I love the question though, because I hadn't really thought about that. Now, the second part of your question, it seems like a third super conference isn't really viable and couldn't compete with the viewership of the SEC or the Big Ten. Well, no one's competing with the viewership of those conferences anyway. And is a third mega conference viable? I think one day you could see it. I don't think that's now, but you tell me 15, 20 years from now, I'm not going to rule anything out. I, I, I really don't think you can. In three years, here, here's, where you, here's where it gets complicated. Got to think about this in football terms, sure, but beyond football. If you're going to form a mega conference, right, with the three remaining power five leagues, University presidents would be have to would have to be willing to abandon the schools that are not as valuable to their conference. Would Oregon get left out of that? No. But would Oregon be willing to abandon other schools like Oregon State, for instance? Would Washington be willing to leave Washington State or with the Arizona schools or the Bay Area schools for the Bay Area schools when their media market is too big? But that's what would have to happen there unless you went like Because the ACC's got 16 teams, the Big 12 or the Pac-12, you know, once San Diego State and SMU, hopefully, get here at some point in time, both have 12. I don't know that you can go that big. Like, can you go to a 40-team conference? I don't really know how that works. That'd be more like an alliance than a, a conference at that point in time. But a mega conference with, you know, the best brands of each of those leagues, Clemson, Florida State, you'd probably take Duke and North Carolina. You'd probably throw in, you know, from the Big 12, Baylor, TCU, maybe Oklahoma State and maybe the Kansas schools from the pack. Like something like that sounds great on paper. Don't think it's super practical in uh, in reality there. But fascinating question. I bet that is I bet that'll get people all all hot and bothered in the YouTube comments on the show, which I'm always here for. Always, always here for Uh, a tactical question that definitely needs to be answered because it was a problem at times for Oregon this year, though not as much as the question asker may think. There are more things than you may think available to you on FanDuel to bet on. It's the midway point in the NBA season. It's even come and gone at this point, and it's the perfect time to download FanDuel because March Madness is right around the corner, too. And FanDuel is America's number one sports book. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. Don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, so question here 
I had to put my name banner back up there or else you might not know who I am and can't have that, obviously. Uh, this one from Blazer Duck. One of his, by the way, he's up the ante. He has sent six, que- six questions total that have either been in the mailbag or are currently in uh, the, or are currently in the mailbag. And then there's this one. Still five more in there. I'm just, I'm just telling you, you can always send me questions. We got plenty of time. I'll answer them. I promise. Uh, this one. Hey, Spencer, Oregon has really struggled defending the slant route for years now, especially against a team like Washington State and every team that's in third and short, and especially fourth and short. The slant pass is such a fast bang bang play. If you were Oregon's DC, what would you say or teach the corners to defend and stop these quick first downs so Oregon can get off the field? Love your insight. So I went back and watched a lot of that Washington State game. The thing that was killing them in that one was not so much the slants as the tunnel screens. And eventually an adjustment was made. But to the point that you're talking about there, I think you have to be careful getting specific on a slant route. That's like saying Oregon's getting beat on on fade routes too often in the goal line. It's a really, really tough play to defend. Because you got to remember, Oregon is recruiting good athletes, good football players who are, you know, three, four, five-star recruits, whatever. But the guys on the other side also have really good players. And I think this is less a tactical question for what the corners need to do differently. And in that Washington State game, by the way, Triquez Bridges had that fantastic interception on a slant route, actually. And I think it's 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 about two things defending that that particular route to answer your question uh, specifically. Number one, you have to have the caliber of athletes who can keep up with that particular route because it's been a part of the football route tree for a long time for a reason. If you're one-on-one in man coverage, it's really hard to stop. It is really, really hard because if you are are playing a guy straight up, right, and you don't have inside, outside leverage or, or anything like that, and Unless you anticipate that a slant is coming, which can come from film preparation, but if you guess too often on slant, on on a particular route, you can get burned with another one in man-to-man coverage. If the receiver runs the route correctly, it's not really that guardable in a man-to-man situation, which then leads to a different point, which is I think the the, the nature of your question is coming from how Oregon has defended, generally speaking, pass coverage the last couple of years. And I think there have been a couple factors at play that have allowed some of these, you know, routes breaking over the middle to hurt the Ducks perhaps more than other teams at times. That's just kind of conjecture on my part, but I tend to agree with my guy Blazer Duck here. I think part of it is you've had some linebackers who have struggled in coverage Not necessarily that they aren't physically gifted enough or athletically gifted enough, but that that their awareness or anticipation has just not always been there. But the bigger thing here, I think, and again, this might be an unsatisfying answer, but the introduction of the RPO has made slants almost impossible to stop. Because anytime that route is being thrown, There's almost always a run element to what the offense is doing. So then what happens is if the pass is going to be thrown to the slant route, it's because the linebackers have probably vacated to come up and play the run, which is an option. And it's a difficult thing in the college game because offensive linemen can go up to three yards down the field. I actually think they should change that rule. I think it's too advantageous for the offense. But you can go up to three yards down the field as an offensive lineman when the pass is thrown and it's not an illegal man downfield. In the NFL, it's one yard. And that makes a huge, huge difference. So I think the reason we've seen Oregon struggle with that in the last couple of years is because everybody is struggling with it now. Because there are not that many offenses that are just lining up and saying, hey, we're just going to go straight slant route man to man here. No, usually there's going to be a run component to the play, and that makes it almost impossible to defend. Because if the linebackers suck up, then you throw the slant route in behind. 
whether it's zone or man coverage. But and if it's man coverage, it's there's a good chance that 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 slant route is coming from the slot, and so you're not playing press man there very often. Oftentimes, you're covering him with with a nickel or a safety. So it's either that or the linebackers sit back, play the slant, but then there's more room in the running game. That's why it's such a difficult play, and why the RPO is such a, a big part of college offenses now. I love the question though. Um, and I too, just generally speaking, would like to see Oregon get off the freaking field on third down. Cause the last couple of years, man, it's just a gut punch just over and over. It's like, yeah, third and eight, not off the field, third and 12, not off the field, third and three, not off the field. Just, uh, it's been, it's been brutal. Absolutely brutal. Um, that's where Oregon needs to get better. That comes from play calling. That's, that's why that, that Chris Hampton hire from Tulane. Interested to see if that makes a big difference. Hope it does. Next question from DJ Spencer. You and I are one in the same. Bring the smoke. By the way, these questions coming from the YouTube comments or Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at locked on ducks DMS wide open Twitter mentions, whatever, you know, how to get in touch with you might by now, but some of you may be new and I appreciate all the new people here. So just want to keep you all informed on that front. Spencer, you and I are one in the same. Well, As Rocket from Guardians of the Galaxy once said, ain't nothing like me, except me. But I feel you. Uh, Bring the smoke. Love it. Question. What are the implications on a university when they cancel, i.e. Ohio State and Washington? Sounds like it's easier to cancel than create a new game the same year. Yeah. So this has actually happened to a couple Pac-12 schools. Michigan bailed on UCLA. Ohio State bailed on Washington. The answer, and I don't know the specific amount, partially, is that the schools that initiate the canceling, if it's not a mutual agreement to cancel the game, then the school that is canceling, which I I assume, given that we've seen it happen a couple times with Big Ten schools, they can do at any point in time and at will, they do have to pay something to Washington. So Ohio State will have to give some amount of money. I have no idea how much. No idea, but my understanding is that because they're canceling the game and making it worse for Washington, which they absolutely are, and Michigan did the same thing to to UCLA, that they then have to pay them some money because they're losing a big opportunity on, on that front. But in terms of finding another game, this is the other reason it really does suck for Washington that Ohio State canceled on them or that UCLA had Michigan cancel on them finding a game on short notice for a quality opponent because of the backwards way that college football does scheduling and they do it many years in advance for non-conference games instead of annually it makes it really hard to find a quality opponent so UCLA for instance was supposed to play Michigan this year instead their three non-conference opponents were Bowling Green who they were going to play anyway Alabama State who they scheduled instead of Michigan and South Alabama Well, it was supposed to be Bowling Green, who play in the... Don't know. Um, Now I'm going to look that up. That's You know, when those things come to me in the middle of taping the show, um, I just, I I always have to... Yeah, they play in the Mid-American. So Bowling Green plays in the Mid-American. South Alabama plays in the Sun Belt. So those are, you know, by games for sure, but they're not FCS opponents. But instead of playing Michigan, they had to play Alabama State because it's done through connections at some level. A coach knows somebody here. Coach knows somebody there. That's that's more the case, uh, though, though, as I say, in basketball, in football, there are a lot of considerations for how you determine, you know, a home and home series, whether or not you've got history with that school, whether or not that'd be a good opportunity for your school to, to play, whether or not it'd be a good game, all that sort of stuff. TV draw. Those factors all go into play. So the fact that it's done so far in advance means that Washington now has, you know, a year and a half basically to find a game. But everybody's already got their 2024 and beyond for the most part non conference schedule set. So Washington's now going to be scrambling just to find any game. And they're probably going to end up with someone closer to Alabama State's caliber than Ohio State's. And that, 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 that's why it's a bummer for the Pac-12 
that those Big Ten schools said, no, we're just not going to give you those games. We don't want to do it anymore. We want to, you know, play Middle Eastern Tennessee Technical Institute's JV team, beat them to a pulp, have a win, and then, you know, use that to bolster our our, our resume going forward into the college football playoff. It's, yeah, it, it, it sucks. Scheduling. I thank you so much for this question, DJ. First of all, I like when people agree with me. I also like when people don't agree with me because then I have an opportunity to learn things sometimes because some of you have really good informed takes. But I also appreciate any opportunity I get to air just how ridiculous college football scheduling is because it's completely messed up, completely backwards. It's not the best for certain schools. It's not the best for certain conferences. And it's certainly not the best for the fans. Absolutely backwards. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm with you there. And it is indeed easier to cancel a power five game than go find a new one. Because Oregon, I'm pretty sure let's see what their uh their 2020 2024 football schedules from FBSschedules.com. Yeah, they've got Texas Tech. So, you know, if Oregon bailed right now on uh on Texas Tech. For, for the home and home that they've got scheduled for this year and next year, there, there aren't going to be really any power five teams left. Everybody's already set on that front. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's a bummer for the dogs. We close with some basketball talk as usual here on the show. Uh, good news. We got, we got some good news on the basketball front. Have you guys seen the movie red or red two? Let me tell you, I would watch eight of those movies. They're outstanding. Bruce Willis, Morgan Freeman in the first one. Sorry, I kind of spoiled that, but still great. Helen Mirren, John Malkovich. They're just, they're they're hilarious. They're so much fun. I love those movies. They're really, really good. In the second one, there's this scene where Han, who's a contracted serial killer, not serial killer, uh, a contract killer, assassin sort of guy, is trying to kill Bruce Willis. And he is firing one of those like chain gun things at him and Bruce Willis and John Malkovich are hiding behind a white van. And he basically saws the van in half with those, you know, really high caliber rounds. And this is going to apply to Oregon women's basketball in a moment. I promise. And Han is shooting and then he stops and he yells at him. He says, you dead yet, Moses. And Bruce Willis says, not yet. That is Oregon women's basketball right now. See, that all tied in really nicely. So going into yesterday, they were first team out of the field of 68. They picked up a conference tournament win against Washington, and their season as of now is alive. Now, can they get an at-large? Maybe. I, I mean, I mean, winning that game certainly doesn't hurt. In fact, it helps you a little bit. Does it help you a lot? Eh, maybe not, but you never know. If Kelly Graves' team is about to go on a run, it was going to have to start yesterday, and it was looking kind of sketchy. But let me tell you something. Andrea Rogers, whew, she was hooping last night. Absolutely balling. And you'll love to see. I think she finished with 28. Oregon went through this long stretch where they decided not to score for a little bit. And then Andrea Rogers said, all right, screw this. I'm just going to go do all of the scoring right now. And she did just that. And they came up with a stop on the final possession, one by two. Boom, big time. So. Still alive, not dead yet. I'm really glad I got to work red into today's show. That's my favorite element of the show so far. Uh, on the uh, slightly negative side, I should have led with this because I like saying the bad news first and then hearing the good news. Anyway, the men's team is completely off the bubble, it seems. They're not in the first four out. They're not in the next four out. They've got Cal tonight. They've got Stanford on Saturday. It looks like it's conference tournament or bust. So we'll see what happens next week. We will see what happens. And by the way, just so some of you have it on your radar, there will be no shows until Friday of next week. There will be a show tomorrow, and then there will be no shows until Friday. So Monday through Thursday, you're going to have to power through and make do without locked on ducks, but I appreciate all of you. I'll be in Disney world. So that's just like, you know, one of those things. Um, normally I'd go on vacation. I'd record shows, but that's one vacation. Where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to, we're going to, we're going to take it, take a little pause here. 
I'd like to think I've earned that. Maybe I haven't. If I haven't, let me know and you won't change my mind on that. Appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.